Okay, guys, can you hear and see me okay? This is the first time I've tried to do this on the new computer. Uh, my old one broke down, and this one would not work. I actually had to take this to a friend of mine who knows more about computers than I do and uh, get this started. It looks like we're going. Can someone just give me a yes if you can hear and see me okay? Yes, okay, perfect, excellent, thanks guys, thanks. Um, who was that? R. Domer, R. Domer 2, 2010, thank you, thank you. Okay guys, excellent. Um, so the thing we're gonna get started on tonight, and I'm gonna jump right into it, you know, normally I give people a little time to show up, talk about something, uh, <clears throat> I talk about something just to give people a few minutes to get here, but tonight there is a lot to cover uh, in this particular subject. We're talking about the fae or what people call fairies. And honestly, I hate that word just because it gives people an idea about that, that it's something that they understand, that it's something that's portrayed in popular culture. And these things are absolutely nothing like what people think whenever they hear the word fairy or whenever they hear the word fae. Uh, these are, you know, we've talked about things in, in the past few. Uh, yeah, exactly. David, David says Tinkerbells. Uh, that's exactly right. That's the thing most people think of whenever they think of fairies. They think of things like Tinkerbell or they think of garden gnomes or, you know, these harmless, cute little things. Um, and these are probably the things that fall into the realm of Fae are probably by far the most horrifying things within the entire realm of uh, what people call the supernatural or the paranormal or whatever, you know, I don't even like those words, but whatever word you want to put on it, they are probably the, uh, the last things in that realm that you want to come in contact with. Now there's a lot about them that's very confusing just because they distort human consciousness. That is the key characteristic of the fae, of the fairies. They distort your consciousness. Coming into contact with them, uh, you know, it's like last time when we were talking about one of my favorite movies, and the reason this is one of my favorite movies is just because it shows so accurately what it can be like to come in contact with something from this realm of being. Uh, it's the Mothman Prophecies. And there's a scene in the movie where Richard Gere is on the phone. He keeps being called by this thing. You know, if you've never seen that movie, I highly, highly recommend it. It is based on a true story. It takes place in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which is actually not very far from where Lori grew up at. Uh, it takes place around an, a, a few events, but the main one is the collapse of the Silver Bridge where all of these people started seeing something and being contacted by something before this horrendous catastrophe. And, you know, one of the, the guys in the movie, uh, he eventually ends up wandering out into the woods and freezing to death. They find him, you know, he wanders out in the woods. Uh, they find him the next day froze to death. But even after his time of death, people had received phone calls from him after he was already dead. They were receiving phone calls from him. That is exactly the sort of thing that happens in the realm of faith. We're going to get into how they manipulate human consciousness uh, because honestly, that's the most telltale mark of them. And it's also the thing that most people have no defense against whatsoever. The movie is the Mothman prophecies. And the reason I bring it up is because the Richard Gere character at one point when he's talking to this thing tells him its name is Indrid Cole. Whenever he's talking to Indrid Cole, at one point he asks it, he says, what do you look like? And Indrid Cole says, it depends on who's looking. 
that is very, very much what it's like coming in contact with these things. Now, it also can become confusing because since they manipulate and distort your consciousness, uh, you may not even think you are dealing with a fae. You may think it's a hag. You may think it's a vampire. You may think it's a demon. You may think it's a ghost. Uh, you know, even there are things like someone pointed out when we were talking about the realm of cryptozoology and how, um, you know, for example, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my brain went blank. Oh, in cryptozoology, when you're talking about creatures like, say, Bigfoot. Um, give me one second, guys. I'm going to cover the comments up just so I don't lose my track of lose my train of thought. Uh, what were we just talking about? Oh, uh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, things like that. Uh, now, in cryptozoology, basically what they're dealing with, and these things are straightforward, like a Sasquatch, if it exists, who knows? I don't know. Personally, I don't care. As long as it's not messing with me, I don't care what it's doing. You know, same way with aliens. Uh, people think that the Fae are not sighted in the world anymore. They are and they match the description of aliens. Now keep in mind, in, in all of these stories about people coming in contact with extraterrestrials, whatever you wanna call them, there is not one single piece of evidence that would lend us, lend credibility or lead us to believe that these things are actually something from another planet. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that would lead us to believe that what they are is something from the realm of the Fae. They share a lot of the same characteristics. Uh, maybe we'll get into that if we have time. Um, but the thing with the Sasquatch, you know, when we're talking about cryptozoology, that's pretty straightforward. And there's pretty, you know, pretty standard hallmarks. Like when most people say they saw something to do with this thing, you know, it fits all the criteria of an animal. They see a track in the mud. It's got five toes. You know, it looks like a glorified gorilla for the most part. Half man, half uh, gorilla, maybe something like that. You know, if they smell it, it smells like a, a, a wild animal covered in fur, things like that. Uh, on the other hand, there are other sightings of something very, very similar, but it's probably not in the same vein at all. It is not a animal. It's not you know, something that just haven't, that hasn't been discovered yet. It's probably the Fae. Uh, but the difference is like, if it does leave a track, it can have any number of toes, like six, seven long claws. When people see this thing, the number one characteristic, they say it smells so bad that it short circuits your thinking. Just the funk of it is horrifically bad. Kind of like what people used to say about when demons would appear back in medieval times. Um, and, and, you know, it can be any color of the rainbow. You know, usually if people see a Sasquatch, it's going to be either like white or brown or black. Uh, if it's a fae that's manipulating your consciousness and for some reason making you see that, it could be any color of the rainbow. It can have fangs. It can, you know, there can be all sorts of stuff about it. So the Fae, you know, we may think we're coming in contact with all kinds of things, uh, including dead people, you know, the spirits of people who have passed on, ghosts. Um, we may think it's uh, pretty much anything under the rainbow. We may think it's a, an angel or anything else because they distort our consciousness. But I'm going to read to you some things first about trying to make sense of fairies. The long history of interactions between fae and human has given rise to an, an enormous amount of lore regarding fae and fae-like beings. If the phenomena of fairy were relatively straightforward, the sheer volume and complexity of this lore would long since have been reduced every would long the sheer volume and complexity of this lore would long since have reduced every detail of fairy to a matter of detailed knowledge. The phenomena of fairy, however, are anything but straightforward. And as a result, the amount that we actually know about these beings is quite limited. 
Every statement one can make about fairy risk falling afoul of what is, in many ways, the defining characteristic of the fairy realm. The role of illusion, or to give it its traditional name, glamour. And that's what they're talking about. When you read about, um, like in these old medieval writings where people are talking about glamour in magic, you know, they're not talking about the, the word in the way that we use it in modern times. When they use the word glamour, what they are talking about is, um, give me one second, guys. Uh, what we're talking about is, is what we were just saying about the ability to manipulate consciousness. Um, let me see. The traditional lore of glamour actually makes a good deal of sense when approached from the standpoint of magical philosophy. For more common human perspectives, by contrast, it makes no sense at all. And this points to a central point about how much that we know or think we know about faith. Dealing with the fairy realm are always dealings with the fairy realm are always hedged with complicated taboos, odd rituals, unexplained requirements, and equally unexplained prohibitions. What all this suggests is that in the creatures of fairy, we are actually dealing with entities who are not human, whose actions do not follow human logic or respond to human concerns. To encounter fairy, even distantly, is to brush against the absolutely other. And then, you know, there's all kinds of, here's the thing, even amongst the Fae, there's all kinds of things that um, we may think we know about them, like different types of the Fae, like the way they've appeared different people over time, and they've appeared in a bunch of different ways. You know, anything from like tall and slim and blonde haired and blue eyed to the Nordics to, you know, little tiny stunted brown things to, to other different cultures. Like they're all over the map. And, and people used to try to classify these things, you know, into different uh, categories and say, there's this kind, there's this kind, there's that kind. Thing is, we don't know. We don't, we have no clue because they can look like anything they want to look like, or they make you perceive them as however they want to perceive you to perceive them. And the thing about this is what I really want to get into, what I really want to talk about is uh, essentially how this is, allows us to better understand magic. Because when you understand the Fae, when you understand their level of reality and how they interact with us, you will understand magic on a whole new level. One other thing, though, it's worth noting, finally, that at least in traditional fairy lore, human beings are by no means powerless against the activities and illusions of the Fae. The most potent tool in the human arsenal is iron which repels Fae and can kill them if it is brought suddenly into contact with their bodies. See this, what I was holding up in the, uh, what do you call it, the thumbnail video? This is iron. This is powdered iron, just shavings of iron. What iron does is collapses etheric energy. If you know how when we're talking about etheric energy, how I said it is like uh, heat rising off the highway in the distance. If you train yourself to be able to see that and you do see that, you can throw iron through it. Uh, you can make stabbing gestures if you have some sort of iron implement. We're going to get into more of this. But, uh, you know, this is one of the absolute best things that you can possibly use in defense against these particular kinds of entities and intelligences. And I even have it like in a, uh, like in a salt shaker so that you can just, you know, throw it through the air. If you want to, you can put it on the ground, whatever you want to do with it, but we're going to get into more of why this works. Give me one second. Puzzling though Faye may be, we are not entirely without ways of making sense of their actions and powers. We can begin making sense of fairy by looking again at the etheric level of existence. Remember what we were talking about, how there are different levels of reality. There's the physical, there's the etheric, there's the astral, there's the mental, there's the spiritual. There's all these different levels of, of 
basically existence. And we exist on all of these different levels of reality. We, human beings, we exist on all of them. We're going to get into how the Fae interact with us and how they manipulate consciousness on these other levels of reality. Uh, while it's misleading to think of the etheric level as some sort of other dimension in science fiction terms, it surrounds us constantly and, and can be perceived directly by anyone willing to learn and practice relatively simple exercises. It is, to some extent, a realm of its own. It has its own landscape, for example, made up of different densities and qualities of etheric substance, partly related to the physical landscape but partly independent of it. It also has its own inhabitants, being who exist on every level of reality except the physical one. Such beings have their consciousness focused on the etheric level, just as ours is normally focused on the physical one. There are many different kinds of etheric entities. The wild diversity of physical life on earth is matched by an equal richness on the etheric level. And that's what I mean about how most people think, you know, when I'm talking about an ecosystem that we live, we exist in an energetic ecosystem. You know, people try to simplify the stuff and, and say that, you know, there's just angels and demons and ghosts. The truth is, that's like saying, you know, in the physical world, there's nothing but people and dogs and cats. You know, we know that there is a tremendous variety of life on the physical realm of existence. There's insects, there's birds, there's mammals, there's reptiles, there's amphibians, there's all kinds of stuff here. That's true also of the etheric level of existence. There are things there that have never been named, things that most people have probably never come into contact with, anything from, from gods on down the line. Of the inhabitants of the etheric level, the beings we've we've called Fae, feel roughly the same position that human beings hold in the physical world. They, like we, use languages and tools, are capable of abstract thought, and shape their behavior on the basis of learned cultural ideas rather than purely that of inherited instincts. So like animals operate from a level of inherited instincts, you know, like, like the less evolved animals, like say, for example, the snake, other animals that are higher up the chain, they may have, they may act more from consciousness, you know, but like a snake, it's going to be more about instinct. Uh, an alligator, it's going to be more from, from instinct. There are also things on the etheric level of reality uh, that are that same way. Like, for example, larva, you know, like in the physical level of reality, we have things like flies and maggots and, and all sorts of insects that break down physical matter uh, and return it back into to earth, there are also things like that on the etheric level of reality, that their entire function is to basically break down etheric energy, discarded energy, to eat it, break it down, turn it into compost, whatever. These things are normally harmless. They, you know, there's no reason to be concerned about them. Every so often though, they can attach to a person. You know, the reason they would do that is maybe if your etheric body has been damaged in some way and you're kind of bleeding out etheric energy into the etheric level of reality, they may mindlessly attach to you and, and that can cause damage, but you can get rid of those. You know, that, that's going to be really common. I mean, not really common. I'm sorry. Uh, and you can get rid of them in the same way you can get rid of some of the fae. Uh, one second. On the other hand, all of these things are shaped by the etheric level rather than the physical one. Etheric tools are unlike physical tools. Language is expressed by projecting thought patterns through the ether differ in profound ways from languages expressed by sound vibrations in air or colored marks on solid paper. An environment of shifting etheric energies calls for different kinds of intelligence from an environment of physical solids, liquids, and gases. So basically, these things have counterparts to everything we have, but they do not operate exactly the same way that our counterparts operate. For example, when we communicate with each other in the physical realm, we're doing it verbally. 
you know, most people. You've got people, of course, that speak in sign language or, or what have you. But for the most part, we're speaking verbally. Things that exist on that level of reality, like the Fae, they are not actually speaking whenever they communicate to you. Whenever they communicate to you, there are no words that can accurately convey exactly how it is to experience that communication. It's almost like a combination of images that you receive or a sense of suddenly just knowing something that they have projected to you. And the reason for that is because they are implanting something directly into your aura. When I am speaking to you, it's coming from me, going through your ears, you're processing it. Whenever the Fae convey something to each other or to you, they imprint a pattern directly into your aura. The difference in levels has some odd consequences, which make sense only if the basic ideas of magic are kept in mind. Since we exist on the etheric level, just as much as phase do, they can perceive our etheric bodies clearly in much the same way that we perceive physical objects. Our feelings and thoughts also tend to show up clearly on the etheric level as colors and patterns in the aura. So their etheric perceptions allow Faye to read human minds and hearts with a fair degree of accuracy. So basically, it's very, very hard to hide anything from them. And this is why, you know, things like going back to the Mothman, Richard Gere starts testing it at some point. Like at when he's on the phone with it, he gets a phone call and it's like this really uh, distorted voice on the end of the line. He's communicating with it. He starts to do things like at, when he's asking it questions, like, what do you look like? And it says, depends on who's looking. At one point, he opens a drawer by the bedside and takes a chapstick out of it. And he asks the thing, what am I holding? And it says chapstick. He puts it in his shoe and puts it under the bed and says, where is it at? And it says, in your shoe under the bed. You can't hide. It's not like these things are all knowing. They are not all knowing. They may try to trick you into thinking they know everything, into thinking they are all knowing, but they are not. What they do is read your emotions, read the thoughts. All of these things create imprints in your aura. You know, you can tell when somebody's mad at you. They don't have to tell you they're mad at you. You can tell when someone is mad at you, even if they're not saying it. That's because on some level, you're picking up things in their aura. You're picking up projections and emotions in their energy field. This is the same thing that these things do. Only they are a hell of a lot better at it than we are. Uh... Let's see. Since Fade don't function on the physical level, though, they don't perceive our physical forms directly, and we normally don't perceive them at all. The lopsided relation between human physical senses and fairy etheric ones is at the root of glamour. Our minds are used to perceiving physical things, not etheric ones. When the Fae wish to interact with humans, they normally have to create the image of a physical form and project it onto what magicians call the sphere of sensation, the aspect of the etheric body that reflects perceptions and sensations up into the higher levels of the self. The sphere of sensation, that was uh, just a, a, a fancy terminology in the Golden Dawn that they used to describe the aura. Uh, that, you know, when you hear the word aura, you usually have, um, you know, maybe even flaky new age connotations of it. Uh, it's, it's still essentially the same thing. Since they have little knowledge of the physical world, their images typically come from the most readily available source, our own thoughts and imaginings, which are present in the sphere of sensation as well. Meaning whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling is going to leave imprints in your aura that they can see because they exist on the same level of reality that your aura does. They don't exist on the same level as our physical bodies. They exist on the same level as our energy so they can read it. They can see it. You can't hide what you're feeling from them. Unless 
you are can know enough to use magic to do it. This is why human ideas about fae or aliens are so often reflected back to us in the form of actual experiences. The fae are real, but the shapes they take when they appear to us are borrowed from our own imaginations. That's why he says, what do you look like? It says, depends on who's looking. They take the way they look from your own mind. These forms are simply tools they use to interact with us and have nothing to do with their actual forms. In their own realm, seen with the etheric senses, they resemble shimmering spheres or ovids of colored light. On the other hand, if we develop our etheric senses and our self-mastery of awareness through magical training, we can learn to meet them directly on their own level and perceive them as clearly as they perceive us. To a very real sense, the power of glamour is a function of human weakness rather than fairy strength. It is because we are so easily confused and distracted by everything around us that the Fae find it so easy to do a little confusing and distracting of their own. The leprechaun, according to legend, can be forced to yield up its treasure if you can keep watching it without letting your attention wander for so much as a moment. This has so much in common with experience and meditation that Zen masters in America use it as a metaphor for meditative practice. The gold that you get from the leprechaun is uh, a change in consciousness that is equivalent to um, what we would call enlightenment. Enlightenment is the gold that you get by never taking your attention off the leprechaun, in other words. There's an important lesson here. Glamour is hardly limited to the realm of fairy. Most human beings live most of their lives under its spell chasing after treasures that, like the golden coins in countless fairy tales, turn to dried leaves the moment one looks away. The etheric nature of fairy creatures also goes a long way to explain why folklore traditions about fae and ghost have so often become deeply entangled, since fae and ghost are both etheric entities. It's quite possible that in earlier times, human souls who failed to pass through the second death might have become part of the complex ecosystem of etheric entities that form the fairy realm. Meaning that people that died, it's very, very possible under certain circumstances, people who die can merge with the realm of the fae and basically take up a new existence in the realm of the fairy in the realm of the fae they don't you know go on into the second death they don't haunt this world they basically join with the fairies and this leads to a lot of those old stories you know the ones where you hear about people being abducted or people being uh fate led away by the fae uh, all of that kind of stuff that's part of what they're talking about Certainly the role of the human etheric body in the death process explains a great many of the features of legends about fairy abductions. The difference between those abductees who were able to return and those who could not was simply that the latter were dead. In human terms, their physical bodies had been taken from them. Some legends claim that food offered by fairies was often poisonous toadstools under a glamour. This suggests one way in which this could have been managed. In other words, they make you see poison as delicious food. If they want you to stay with them in their level of reality, they can make you see poison as a birthday cake. You eat it, no idea that you're killing yourself, and you never leave them. You are with them forever because you don't have a physical body to come back to. Uh, stolen infants similarly could be extracted not only from their cribs, but from their physical bodies as well. While the abandoned body would normally have died after a short time, it might also be taken over by another entity, perhaps a fae, perhaps some other astral or etheric being, and turned into a fair approximation of the changelings of legend meaning essentially that the fairies, the fae, whatever you want to call them, are also capable of stealing 
an infant or even an adult in certain instances pulling it right out of its own body and then something else takes over the body while the spirit, the soul, whatever you want to call it, that's in the body gets taken off to the realm of fairy. That's why they call it a changeling. That's when they talk about like the fairies took someone's child and left one of their own uh, in its place. Um, Equally, the traditions of sexual contact between humans and fae can be understood from an ethnic perspective. As magicians have been pointing out for a long time, sex is much more an ethnic phenomena than a physical one. A being that is able to stimulate the ethnic channels of sexual energy in the human body directly, instead of having to rely on the indirect means of friction and nerve stimulation, could easily create the sort of feverish eroticism one finds in fairy lore. Reproduction is a more complex matter. It seems unlikely that fae human intercourse could ever have produced physical pregnancies and births, at least, but in the absence of clearer knowledge, it's hard to be sure. Traditional means of protection against fairy beings, finally, also have a clear ethnic basis. Those human beings who have not awakened their inner senses and powers can do very little to affect the fae directly or indirectly, except by using the ethnic effects of certain kinds of physical matter. Iron, which causes the explosive collapse of etheric patterns and certain volatile plant compounds, which disperse or erase them, are among the few available options. Human beings who know how to perceive and shape the etheric realm, on the other hand, can interact with the fade directly on their own ground. Unfortunately, human beings have had at least one powerful influence on the fairy realm, and it has not been for the better. Modern approaches to agriculture, industry, and community design have had more impacts on the environment than most human beings ever perceived. Our civilization has defaced the countryside and the wilderness, not only in a physical sense, but on the etheric level as well. Human visionaries for more than 200 years have been reporting what a good deal of horror on the etheric miasma that surrounds the sprawling, smoky cities of the industrial world. It's not surprising then that the old, almost friendly relations between human and fae described in folklore have fallen into abeyance over nearly all of the world. If our cultures can bring themselves into a wiser relationship with the natural world, it's possible that better relations can be restored. But that remains to be seen. Yes. So that is the main part. I'm just looking at what you guys are saying. Give me one second. Uh, you guys are asking about past lives. Um, one of the ways, you know, this is just kind of off subject here, uh, but one of the ways to remember past lives, we've talked about this uh, quite a few times in the past, is most people can't even remember what they had for lunch on this day last week. If you can't remember this day last week, what you ate then, then imagine how hard it is to try to remember past lives. Wow. Uh, Andrew Reyes, yes, Andrew says, as a metaphor, is the way they see us and the way we see them could be like the predator sees humans. That is a really, really good analogy. That is that is really close to it. The only thing is, I think in the predator movies, it's been a long, long time since I've seen one of those. Like I haven't seen one of those since the late 80s or early 90s, whenever it was the first one came out. But it seems like if I remember correctly, the predators see heat, like they see uh, body heat that the humans are getting off, uh, giving off. Um, yeah, it would be very, very similar to that, only they're seeing the energy that we give off. Yes, that is exactly it. Um, Nick says, is it druid orders that attempt to interact with the fae? Uh, there are druid orders that do, just like there are uh, magical orders that do. Um, 
Let me see. Heat signatures. Yes, yes. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Bear says, my daughters want to know if the Fae can communicate with animals. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, they can communicate with anything that has an energy body and anything that has consciousness, anything that is sentient has an energy body. Um, so yes, they can, they can do the same things to animals that they can do to humans. Uh, Benjamin says, are all of the Fae malicious in nature? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, there's all kinds of stories about house fate. You know, this is, the, you know, some of this stuff seems so horrendous to talk about now just because of the way it's been treated in modern cultures. You know, when most people now think of house fate, they're going to think of uh, Dobby or Doby or whatever his name was from uh, the Harry Potter shows. You know, there are house fate, spirits of the house. And you can find these things all the way back to Roman times. The Romans usually looked at them almost as like really, really minor gods. And this existed all the way up, not just in Roman times, but it existed all the way up until they still had them in Salem. I, you know, I lived in Salem, Massachusetts for a while. Uh, and, and one of the really old houses that they have there that's been preserved since, you know, the birth of Salem, uh, still has, I can't remember what they called these things, but it's a box on the wall that they would leave offerings in for the spirit of the house, the, the house fae. In Rome, they called them, they looked at them as being like minor gods. Um, yeah, yeah, Bradley. Bradley says, do you often carry an iron flask when you travel to, to places like New Orleans. I do. I take a lot of stuff with me whenever I travel. Um, New Orleans is a, when you go to New Orleans, it's a different reality from New York. You know, I could say it's a different world and it is, but it's also a different reality. You know, when I was there, it's like, you know, there's almost like no distinction between death and life down there. You know, it's hard to comprehend this, to understand what this is, what I mean by this. But like when you're there, it's like nothing else exists outside of there. You know, when like, especially compared to places like New York, you know, like the pandemic going on, all of the political garbage going on down there. They're not focused on any of that stuff down there. It's like nothing exists outside of New Orleans. Uh, they're not looking at the rest of the world. They're not concerned about it. Could, could I feel, um, could I feel dark forces attacking or reaching out to you like the Fey on the trip? No, not exactly. Uh, you know, stuff like that. It's really, really hard for something like that to attack you, uh, to attach to you. If you've been doing a lot of magic, which is the thing we're going to get to in the next episode, we're going to talk about different ways of protecting yourself, uh, different ways of strengthening your aura so that these things can't manipulate your consciousness, latch on to you, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, those, those things really, uh, Oh, Karen, this is a really good question, Karen. Karen says, why do the Fae interact with us? What's beneficial to them? The answer to that is we don't know. Their, uh, their thinking, their logic, their reasoning is beyond anything that we understand. They do not think the way we think. It is impossible to figure out what their motivations are. You know, they do whatever they do for their own reasons entirely. They do not think the way we do. And believe it or not, there are people that do not think the way most people do. You know, I'll give you one example. In the Golden Dawn, 
uh, or in all magical orders, basically, that use the, this particular grade system. Once you reach a certain level of the system, it's said that uh, a person at that stage of development will be beyond the comprehension or understanding of all those in the grades below. That's because uh, you will not operate on the same levels. You will not think the same way. You will not have the same motivations. You know, for example, we were talking last time, we touched on this a little bit about desire, how your desire is what keeps you chained to the material world that causes you to incarnate here over and over and over. That's what desire does. It's something that is inherent within your flesh that causes you to incarnate within this realm over and over and over. The only way to get beyond that is to use desire to rid yourself of desire. Well, a person that no longer has desire will be beyond the comprehension of people who still do. They will not be able to understand why such a person does what they do because that person will no longer have the same motivations that uh, the average person does. Um, Colin says, is that around the Magister Templi in the order? No, that's, that's uh, Ipsissimus is what they call a person who has reached that stage. I have not seen a movie called The Knowing with Nick Cage, Vegas Vamp. I have not. Uh, but, you know, going back to that topic for a second, uh, if, if there are people that are beyond the comprehension of most people, then we can't even begin to hope to understand things like the Fae, what their reasoning, what their logic is. And someone had asked last time, you know, a lot of people have trouble wrapping their minds around this thing about desire and ridding yourself of desire. And someone even said last time they don't understand this because it's desire that makes them want to be a better person. It makes them want to better themselves, all that sort of thing. Uh, a person who has reached that level of understanding knows you cannot become a better person. There is not one single thing in this world that you can ever do which will make you more than you are right now. That's entirely of the ego. The ego always wants to be more. It always, you know, it wants to collect things. It wants to collect degrees. It wants to collect abilities. It wants to collect things, relationships things that will make it feel like it is gaining something, that it is becoming more. You cannot become more. You are infinite consciousness. You are God incarnate. You are the source of all creation in a human body. Nothing that you can ever do, nothing that you can ever learn, Nothing that this, no degree or title or anything else that anyone in this world can ever bestow upon you is going to make you more than you already are. You cannot be a better person. Anytime you try to be a better person, you are acting from ego. A person who has desire, uh, that, that has rid themselves of desire you know, Eckhart Tolle says at one point, he says, um, no, no, Chris. Chris says, so you can't become less either? No, no, but you can't become less, but you can lose. Here's the thing, and here's what I mean by that. People think that through enlightenment, they're going to gain something. They think that enlightenment is a process of gaining something. It is not. Enlightenment is loss. When you become enlightened, you lose everything. You lose your illusions. You lose your sense of, you know, self-individuality from all that is. 
you lose everything that makes you you because those things were really never yours in the first place. There is no you. Yes, Vegas Vamp says the grand sacrifice. That's exactly what the ultimate reality is. And I'll give you, I'll give you one example. There was a man who uh Here's the thing. You cannot be completely and absolutely enlightened and still stay in this realm of reality. You cannot. If you want to stay here, you have to hold on to some small piece of that desire. And I'll give you one example. There was a man who was almost completely and absolutely enlightened the but he would be you know he would have people over to his house he would be giving talks he would be teaching these people and even whenever he was in the midst of teaching them he'd say hold on a second he'd go into the kitchen where his wife was and he would be you know looking over her shoulder saying what are we having for dinner what's you know what are you cooking and she said to him she said you know this is ridiculous you know, these people think that you're some enlightened master and the only thing you're worried about is filling your stomach. He said, food is the desire that I hold on to, to allow me to continue existing in this level of reality. The day that you come to me with food and I say no, you'll know I'm getting ready to die because I will have released the last bit of desire that allowed me to stay in this world. Years went by and sure enough, one day she brought him a plate of food and uh, he just shook his head and she started crying because she knew that meant he was about to leave. He was about to let go. Whenever you reach complete and absolute, complete lack of desire, you can't stay here anymore. Uh, you will have untangled yourself too much from the physical body and you'll start to go. I had a point to this, I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, People will ask sometimes, well, if you don't have desire, then, you know, why be here? Why do anything? And it's basically to continue the process of transforming yourself into light, into pure light. That's what you're doing with, uh, Malcolm, with, with alchemy and magic. Uh, you are slowly and gradually transforming your consciousness into pure light. No, Paige. Paige says, does this mean that no one on earth is enlightened? Think of enlightenment as almost degrees. There are degrees of enlightenment. Think of it as a scale from one to a hundred. There are people here. One is someone with a consciousness so dense that all they can perceive, all they can understand is normal earthbound reality. All they know is have a couple of kids and, and work a job that they hate until one day they retire and all that sort of stuff. Uh, think of that as one. Think of a hundred as someone who just becomes pure light. You have people in this world that are at 99. And you have people in this world that are at all different stages in between, but no one is 100 or they would go. Amanda says, is it possible for the Fae to use desire and ego for their benefit? Absolutely. It absolutely is. Yes, Paige, exactly. Paige says, so they are holding on to minimum desire. Yes. Uh, I was asking someone once, um, I was asking someone, I said, you know, what do you 
do. You know, when you rid yourself of desire in a lot of ways, it almost feels like you're just, you know, kind of killing time here until you die, until you go. And he said, just find a couple of things that you really like doing and do those. That's kind of what what the guy with the eating was doing. You know, for him, food, food was was the minimum desire he held on to. For different people, it's different things. Um, but yeah, you're holding on to, to minimum desire. Yes, gray man says you stop manifesting. Either you stop manifesting or you kind of manifest for the sake of other people. If that makes sense, you know, maybe you've got a couple of kids, maybe you've got a wife, uh, you know, maybe there's someone you're taking care of, whatever it is, and you keep doing things for their benefit, for their sake, not because you want anything, not because desire or ambition or any of those things are, are driving you. And that doesn't mean you also still won't experience, what's the word? Uh, not perception, preference. Desire and preference are two different things. Desire is a type of hunger. When you desire something, you hunger for something. You want things. When you have preference, you don't have that sense of hunger anymore. You are able to make decisions just based entirely on what's going to be for your higher good or what's going to serve a specific purpose, all of those sorts of things. You know, the first, and you'll, this is one of the things, you know, most you'll have, I come, you would not believe how many people I come across that, you know, think they're enlightened or think they're masters or whatever it is. And the, you know, what I always ask them, what the man who taught me started to ask me, like, at, you know, when I experienced the dissolution of self, you know, the, the disintegration of ego, when you start to experience yourself as the infinite consciousness, which inhabits all things, you know, there are there are all kinds of ways. There are all kinds of things you'll go through along this path that you'll think, oh, that's it. I've done it. You know, even when I experienced like the disintegration of self, the dissolution of self, when everything that I thought I was disintegrated and I realized it was all just ego. Even that you think you're done. But when I was describing it to the man who was teaching me. He just looked at me and said, do you still experience desire? Because that was the next level. Even after you experience the disintegration of self, you're still not finished. You will know that you are almost finished whenever you stop experiencing desire. Whenever you no longer desire things in this world. Yes, Amanda says, I'll never be enlightened. This is tough to not desire. Here's the thing. You can't make yourself do it. You cannot. It is the side effect of certain magical practices. There is nothing you can do to make yourself stop desiring. You know, take, for example, something like the, the, the things that will go last are things, you know, for example, like sex. The reason for that is because it is hardwired into your DNA to procreate. Uh, you can't force yourself to get rid of those things. They go away or they cease to exist as a side effect of doing certain practices, but you don't try to force yourself to not desire. You cannot do that. It's impossible. You can't make yourself not desire things. Let me see what you guys are talking about. 
Yeah. Andrew says, would you say if you are desiring enlightenment, it's a good sign that you're not? Absolutely. Yeah. When you truly, yeah, if, if, if you're wanting enlightenment, if you want to experience enlightenment, then you're not enlightened. Yeah, that, that's absolutely. Oh, Zippomatic. That's a good. That's a good comment. Zippomatic says sounds boring, uh, and that's that ego will always think it sounds boring. You know, even when I was younger, I used to think, you know, who the hell wants to live a life of no desire? That sounds boring as hell. You know, I want excitement and I want drama and all this kind of stuff. Uh, was it Socrates? Socrates or Aristotle one said that whenever you do experience the, like the disintegration of desire, the loss of desire, he said, it's like you have been strapped to a bucking Bronco your whole life. And this thing has been going nuts, just kicking and jumping and leaping and doing everything it can to just knock you off of its back suddenly the loss of desire is like someone let you off of that thing. And all you feel is, thank God that's over. That's it. It's not boring. It's peace. That's what it, that's what it, when you hear people talking about peace, the only way you will ever know true peace is with the loss of desire. Yes, absolutely. Your crazy uncle says there is a big difference between severe depression and loss of desire and wanting to transition. Yes, if you want to transition to something, that's another sign that you are not enlightened. If you are, because that's desire. If you desire to transition to some other realm, to some other place, then that's not enlightenment. Enlightenment is the complete and absolute lack of desire. There's you don't desire to go anywhere else. You're fine being right here. You know, there's nothing here you particularly want, but there's nowhere else you particularly want to go either. There's nothing you particularly want to do, but there's nowhere else you particularly want to be. From that point on, your experience come becomes about number one, just living a full, beautiful life and also doing what you can for the benefit of others. You see what you guys are talking about. Yeah, Paige says, it really does feel like the ego clings on to everything. It can, it can so eventually it clings on to spirituality. It absolutely does. Uh, there's a book, if you wanna hear about ego, I mean, if you wanna read about ego and how it, uh, uses spirituality to strengthen itself. There was a book by, um, I believe it's Chogyam Trungpa called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, where that's what he's talking about. Spiritual materialism is when the ego tries to use spirituality to become something else, you know, to say, oh, I'm a Buddhist. I'm a magician. I'm a Christian. I'm a Muslim. I'm whatever. That's just ego using spirituality to construct another. Uh. Oh, Philippe. Philippe says, any idea what comes after no desire to end? Um, you kind of keep, you, you keep practicing. That's what you do. Even once you no longer have any desire to reach any other destination, you continue to practice uh, just because it's better to do something while you're here than it is to do nothing. You know that thing about preference? Preference is what allows you to choose to do something for the higher good uh, versus doing something because you hunger for it. Whenever you hunger for something, the reason you hunger for something, whether it's money, whether it's uh, material objects, whether it's prestige, you know, like like you'll have a lot of people that want to be teachers. Uh, they're hungering for that because they think it's going to fill a hole inside. 
They think it's going to make them feel complete in some way. Uh, it's not. I forgot where I was going with this, what the question was. Um, I forgot what where we were going. Uh, let me see. I know it was Felipe. Oh, you just keep working until there's no you left to work anymore. That's it. Let me see. Yes, Colin says the Buddha kept sitting under the tree after he reached enlightenment. Absolutely. Even after he reached enlightenment, I've talked about this quite a few times, the Buddha would still seal himself off away from the rest of the world and continue doing retreats where he would do nothing but meditate for weeks at a time uh, in between episodes of teaching people, even after he reached enlightenment. Even after you reach enlightenment, even after you reach the point of no longer experiencing desire for anything in this physical world, uh, you keep practicing. See, I'm going to cut off in just a second. Let me see. Yes, Nick says, enjoy all life until you realize you're done with it all. Absolutely. The reason you're here is to love and be loved. That's what we're doing here. Everything else is just ego chatter, illusion. We are here to love and to be loved. We all will express that in a different way, but that's what we're here. That's what we're here for. Um, DGA Snake says, enlightenment, is enlightenment and the great work the same or are they different? Uh, enlightenment is part of the great work. It's not the entirety of it. There is more to go even after enlightenment. Let me see. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to cut this off because we're a little over an hour. Uh, but the next time we talk, what we are going to be talking about is uh, methods of defending ourselves, not only of, not only defending ourselves, but also of making ourselves impenetrable, impenetrable to entities that exist on these other levels of reality and being able to perceive them ways of interacting with them, perceiving them, and making sure that we're not having our consciousness distorted. Uh, we're going to talk about all of the ways of doing that, and some of you guys have already been doing some of those. Let me see. Of course, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for being with me again. Yeah, thank you guys for being with me for another month. Oh, and next time also, if you guys will remind me, we're going to talk about magnum opus and part of how that's going to work, uh, the structure it's going to take. Um, yeah, absolutely. Magnum opus. I'll write that down just in case no one reminds me. I'll bring it up next time. Uh, I've been putting a, a more thought into the structure of how it's going to be. Okay, guys, I love you all, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.